During the American Civil War, inventors on both sides stretched their ingenuity to produce new weapons that would bring advantages on the battlefield. Among these people was a 40-something-year-old man from Hartford County, North Carolina, named Richard Jordan Gatling. When the Civil War started, he was living in Indianapolis. Although a qualified medical doctor, he had led a peripatetic existence, largely as an inventor of agricultural equipment. Based on his success in these endeavours, Gatling immediately turned his hand to weapons, particularly the study of automatic guns that could allow one man to do the killing of a hundred. His objective was to reduce the number of Union soldiers exposed to enemy fire, and thus the deadly diseases that inevitably followed their wounding. His design was completed in 1861 and it was patented in 1862. It was a remarkably simple device, consisting of six rifled barrels in a circular frame, each of the same calibre as the Union's Springfield rifle. The magazine was at the top and fed each barrel in turn before the continuing turn of the gun's crank fired the weapon. One barrel fired with one turn of the crank, and the weapon's rate of fire was limited only by the speed at which the gunner could crank it. The book figure was 50 rounds in 16 seconds. Although it was well reviewed by the military organizations that assessed it, it was only deployed on the battlefield when officers purchased their own weapons. Further development took place over the coming decades, but when Hiram Maxim's recoil operated machine gun was introduced to the world in the 1880s, the Gatling's days were numbered. It was a heavy weapon and more physically laborious to operate than the Maxim. The Gatling did offer much higher rates of fire on a more sustained basis but even so, by 1911 it was declared obsolete by the US Army and retired. It wasn't long, however, before the idea of a multi-barrel weapon was revived by renewed warfare, leading to the first aerial rotary cannon. In August 1916, a Prussian major named Wilhelm Siegert directed the German aircraft industry to develop a machine gun that was specifically designed for aerial use, rather than just being an adapted army machine gun. Siegert's idea was to create a compact, multi-barreled weapon that could be mechanically driven either off the engine or the rudimentary electric system used to operate radios. It would be able to fire a large number of shots in short bursts. One of the results of this instruction was a revolutionary weapon from Leimberger. It was a slightly different take on the rotary cannon idea to Gatling's, and it had 12 barrels chambered for 7.92mm Mauser rifle bullets fire rate was supposedly up to 7,200 rounds a minute. That rate's likely to be a bit overstated as the gun needed to be spun up ahead of firing and even then was dependent to some extent on the quality of the mechanism that took power off the engine. Cartridge quality limited sustained fire rate and the short barrels led to quite poor ballistic performance, but even so the weapon was very promising. German industry, however, had enough to be getting on with, and no examples were used in anger before the armistice. Incidentally, two examples of another of these motor guns, a single-barreled concept made by Siemens, were flown on Albatross fighters. At least one kill was made, but the pilots were forbidden from flying over the front line, so the employment of the weapon was quite limited. After World War I, Fokker, Leimberger's collaborator on the rotary cannon project, moved to the US and took the gun with him. Interestingly, the 1920 US patent for the concept is in the name of one James S. Johnston, who we'll encounter in the next few minutes. Refinement of more conventional machine guns and the appearance of automatic cannons, themselves based on the World War I German Becker, meant that rotary cannon development languished between the wars. The success of the M2 Browning meant that US developments during the Second World War itself also stayed mainly on the test bench. However, this situation changed almost as soon as the war ended. Inspired to some degree by capturing advanced German weapons like the MG213C revolver cannon, the US Army Ordnance Department awarded two contracts for advanced gun development immediately after the war. Their goal was to develop a compact cannon system with a very high rate of fire compared to the Browning machine gun a heavier 20mm round offering improved lethality and the high velocity that aviators believed was essential for effective shooting of a fast-moving jet fighter. One of these contracts went to the Armour Research Foundation of the Illinois Institute of Technology 
and was for development of a revolver cannon. The second was intended to revive the Gatling machine gun architecture. The Armour Institute program would lead to the excellent but short-lived M39 cannon that armed the Super Sabre and Freedom Fighter. The revival of the Gatling concept in the US stemmed from the small arms branch of the US Army Ordnance Research and Development Service. They were seemingly inspired by someone who stumbled across Dr. Gatling's 1893 pattern for an electrically driven version of his machine gun, and put two and two together with the fact that new fighters were likely to have far more electrical power available because of their need for radars, radios, and other avionics. Based on a paper analysis, Johnson Automatics of Providence, Rhode Island, were given a contract for a feasibility study. Their first prototype was an electric motor attached to an 1883 vintage 10 barreled Gatling gun. The result was a fire rate of 5,800 rounds a minute, albeit from the 50 round clips that the weapon drew rounds from rather than a belt. Johnson's feasibility study report in 1948 was thus very positive and paved the way for Project Vulcan, appropriately named after the Roman god of fire and metalworking. Project Vulcan called for a 0.6 inch or 15 mm calibre gun with between 5 and 10 50 inch barrels. The Air Force wanted a minimum of 1,000 rounds per barrel and a maximum weight of 100 pounds per barrel. The 15 mm round stemmed from a pre war anti tank rifle project. The Air Force liked it though because it had very high shell velocity, which their studies showed increased the chances of a hit being scored by 50% for only a 25% increase in shell velocity. Based on this specification, the first test design had five barrels grouped in a circle and it was test fired for the first time in April 1949. Initially capable of short bursts of 2,500 rounds a minute, it was modified to fire 5,000 rounds a minute by June 1950 and then 6,000 rounds per minute in the September of that year. Development continued, leading to several different versions of the rotary cannon. The 15mm calibre weapon was designated T-45A, everything has to have a designation remember. T-45B and T-45C were improved 15mm guns. Confusingly T-45C later became a 20mm weapon and it was then redesignated T-171C, I hope you're following along. Tantalisingly there was also a 27mm cannon called T-150 but General Electric dropped it after initial development had been done. T-45A weighed 435 pounds and could fire 4,000 rounds a minute. Improved design meant that T-45C weighed 365 pounds and could fire 4,600 rounds a minute. 27 Model Cs were thus ordered by the Air Force for testing. The first dozen of them were in 15mm caliber and the balance of 15 were 20mm. Just because the designations weren't confusing enough, the T-45C in 15mm soon became the T-45E1, and the 20mm gun became the T-171E1. Eventually all of the T-45s were rebuilt as 20mm cannons because it was discovered that the 20mm rounds stacked and fed better than the 15mm. These guns were tested under the Gunval project that also deployed cannon-armed savers in Korea, although the Vulcans stayed back in the US. Testing was mainly concerned with durability and high altitude performance. They also tested compatibility with the F-94B Starfire and a turret installation on the B-47. Following the testing, a new T-171E3 was developed with lightweight barrels but also more rigid construction. Maximum rate of fire went up to 6,000 rounds a minute as a result and the cannon was now fed from a rotary drum for consistency and compactness. The E3 version therefore packed the same firepower as four M39s. All of this was in a package that weighed just 295 pounds, less than two M39s. Better still, the externally powered feed meant that any dud rounds didn't cause the weapon to stop. The M39 was a reasonably reliable weapon after it had been developed and it suffered about 1.1 stoppages per thousand rounds fired. The Vulcan, however, suffered only 0.1 stoppages per 1,000 rounds or one every 10,000. Barrel life was also greatly improved. M39 barrels lasted 4,000 rounds before they needed replacement. Because of their constant rotation, the Vulcan's barrels stayed cooler and therefore suffered reduced erosion and of course they fired 50% fewer rounds per barrel. The result was a barrel life of over 50,000 rounds. The Vulcan was initially deployed in 1956 on the F-104A Starfighter 
in an installation that included 725 rounds of ammunition. The initial F-104 installation was not actually very successful. Early experiences highlighted some issues with the early Vulcan related to the system's use of linked ammunition. Misfeeding that hadn't occurred in ground testing did happen in practice, and discarded links were ejected in such volume that they could be sucked into the engine, causing damage. The updated M61A1 featured a linkless ammunition feed system and was installed on the F-104C and the F-105D Thunderchief. Both of these aircraft were deployed to Vietnam, although the small number of starfighters were restricted to escort missions protecting various surveillance, early warning and electronic warfare aircraft. Thunder Chiefs were, however, heavily engaged, and despite the aircraft's severe weaknesses as an air-to-air platform, its pilots were able to gun down 27 MiG-17s and get a half share of another. An F-105 pilot scored the first Vulcan air-to-air kill on June 29, 1966. Of course, air combat in the USAF at the time was supposed to be the sole preserve of the gunless F-4 Phantom. That would have been just fine had the 4AIM-9 Sidewinders and 4AIM-7 Sparrows that each Phantom carried worked as advertised. But they didn't, especially at low altitudes. The Vietnamese were smart enough to know that if they operated their MiG-17s at low level, then they were very difficult for the generally more capable US aviators in their vastly more capable aircraft to get at. On May 5, 1967, the 366th Tactical Fighter Wing reported to 7th Air Force that they had lost, quote, a minimum of seven kills in the past 10 days because of a lack of kill capability below 2,000 feet and inside 2,500 foot range due to new MiG tactics which used ground clutter to mask our missile capability. These tactics were a version of the Lufthansa Circle tactic used during World War I and were proving just as effective 50 years later for defending slow aircraft from fast ones. Fortunately, some months previously, Colonel Boots Blessé had managed to convince 7th Air Force to allow the introduction of a podded Su-16 Vulcan cannon that was carried under the centerline of the No. 1 and No. 3 aircraft in a formation instead of the usual drop tank. The first kill with this weapon was duly made on May the 14th, but even though the 1,600-pound Su-16 pod proved effective, it wasn't really a very ideal system. The pods added drag to the airframe and reduced the amount of fuel that the notoriously gas-guzzling Phantom could carry. The drag was made worse by the fact that the cannon's electrical system was driven by a ram-air turbine. The subsequent Su-23 improved that situation by replacing the ram-air turbine with a combination of electrical power from the aircraft and gun-gas drive but both versions were hampered by the fact that the Phantom didn't have a proper air-to-air gun sight. It was a missile-armed interceptor, after all. Pilots had to aim using good old-fashioned Kentucky windage, and they got some successes, but a better solution was obviously needed. As it happened, the USAF had wanted a gun on the Phantom long before the success of the Sioux pods. It had considered fitting one to the F-4D, but had been dissuaded by the time required to adapt the airframe. The F-4E that was deployed in October 1967 had a Vulcan in the nose and a proper sight, though, because there was more time to develop it. F-4E pilots scored six kills with the gun during the Vietnam War. F-4D and C pilots got ten with the podded guns, the last on September 9th, 1972. An F-4E scored the last gun's kill of the war against a MiG-21 on October 15th, 1972. U.S. tactical aircraft dutifully carried their Vulcans into combat on many occasions in the years that followed. But it was Israeli pilots that were the next to score guns kills with their F-4Es in the 1973 war. Likewise, Israeli F-16 and F-15 pilots almost certainly got the odd victory with them in the 1980s. Exact numbers are pretty hard to come by, though. Iran's F-14 community apparently shot down a helicopter and two MiG-23s with the Vulcan in the war against Iraq. It's likely that one of these MiG kills was the last made with the cannon to date. It's in some ways strange that such a legendary and ubiquitous weapon has actually been used so sporadically, particularly by the US. The Vulcan is, after all, arguably the pinnacle of fighter cannon development. It combines high fire rate and decent shell weight in a lightweight and exceptionally reliable package. But as so often happens with technology, it emerged just as cannons as a whole were being superseded by guided missiles, 
which got better and better over the years. At the end of the 1980s, the Vulcan was still a key part of fighter arsenals, mainly because the Sparrow was far from a reliable weapon even by that point. But as Amram entered service and the Sidewinder continued to improve, the internal gun became a backup to a backup. It's therefore conceivable that we've seen the last ever Vulcan kill on a manned aircraft. That doesn't, however, diminish its impact on aircraft development in the US, and of course it continues as a close-in weapon system. The gun is a legend for a reason, and it's not just because of the noise it makes. 